Written by Gene Roddenberry and Norman Spinrad. Directed by Mark Daniels. This iconic episode was from Season 2, Episode 6. It premiered on October 19, 1967. This episode was Star Trek's version of Moby Dick. Moby Dick was a novel that was written by Herman Melville in 1851. It was the story of an obsessed captain who had been disfigured by a whale. He had become so obsessed with revenge on it that he put himself, his ship, and his crew in jeopardy. It should come as no surprise to my viewers that my favorite film adaptation starred Patrick Stewart as Captain Ahab. This episode had a character named Commodore Decker who became obsessed with his tormentor. The planet killer took his crew from him and eventually his life and the life of his ship, the USS Constellation. It featured William Winden as Commodore Decker. Sadly, we lost William back in 2012. An interesting fact about Commodore Decker is it is actually his son, Captain Willard Decker, who is in command of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 refit until Admiral Kirk takes her back to fight V'ger in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Another interesting fact was due to budgetary restraints on the show, rather than paint the Enterprise filming model to appear as a damaged USS Constellation, it was decided to get the AMT USS Enterprise model kit. Once it was built, they were able to turn it into the Constellation and damage it the way the ship had been damaged by the planet killer and appeared on screen. It is also worth noting that instead of Lieutenant Uhura, we see Lieutenant Palmer manning the communications station. The episode opens with the USS Enterprise responding to a distress call from her sister ship, the USS Constellation. They are on the outer edge of System L-370. Mr. Spock would inform the captain that the entire solar system had been de destroyed. It had been reduced to rubble and asteroids. And where there were seven planets the year before, there was nothing. As the Enterprise approached System L-374, sensors would show the same destruction patterns as L-370. However, Mr. Spock would indicate that the two most inner planets were still intact. Lieutenant Palmer would then inform Captain Kirk that she was picking up a disaster beacon. Mr. Spock analyzed it and confirmed it was from Starship. They would follow the signal and discover it was the USS Constellation. Captain Kirk would order red alert and a sensor sweep of the area. When no threat was detected, Captain Kirk decided to lead a landing party over to the Constellation. With the bridge totally uninhabitable, they decided to focus their search around the auxiliary patrol room. Captain Kirk would order Mr. Scott to check the phasers and see if they had been fired. Captain Kirk noticed that there were no half-empty cups of coffee or meals on the tables, so he deduced whatever happened to the crew, they must have had an advanced warning. In engineering, Mr. Scott would order a full damage control check while he checked the engines. Captain Kirk would contact the Enterprise and he would inform Mr. Spock that the crew was simply vanished. He asked Spock if it was possible that the crew had beamed down to either of the two remaining planets and Mr. Spock had said it was improbable. The inner planet's temperature was that of molten lead and the other planet had a poisonous atmosphere to human life. Later, Mr. Scott would inform the captain that the warp drive was a useless pile of junk, but the impulse engines were not that badly damaged. He also said that the phaser banks were exhausted and that they did not give up without a fight. Scotty suggested using the computer to listen to the duplicate captain's logs from auxiliary control. This is when they first found Commodore Matt Decker. He had been in shock and at first was not sure who Captain Kirk was. Dr. McCoy gave him a stabilizer shot and he started to come around and he recognized Kirk. But when the captain pushed him to give him a description of what attacked his ship, he broke down. Mr. Scott played back the log and it spoke of heavy subspace interference and that they would not be able to inform Starfleet of the destruction in the solar system.
It was also noted that the constellation was investigating the apparent breakup or destruction of one of the solar system's planets. Science officer Masada reported that the fourth planet in system L374 was breaking up and they were going to investigate. Captain Kirk would have Mr. Scott get the sensor tapes and logs to the Enterprise so that Mr. Spock could analyze them. Commodore Decker would inform Captain Kirk that he had to beam his crew down to safety while he stayed with the ship. He beamed them down to the third planet. The planet killer would then hit the constellation knocking out the transporter. And when the planet killer attacked the third planet, his crew called to the ship for help, but Commodore Decker was unable to beam them up. The planet would be destroyed and consumed for fuel before the planet killer would leave. Washburn would report to Captain Kirk that the conclusion of the structural and control damage report was ready. He said something had crashed through the deflectors and knocked out the generators. He went on to say that something deactivated the antimatter and warp drive pods. Commodore Decker would describe it as miles long with a more that could swallow a dozen starships. He went on to say that it must be a weapon. Matt Decker said that they first observed it hovering over a planet, slicing out chunks with a force beam. A scan of the beam would reveal that it was pure anti-proton, absolutely pure. Upon contacting Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock would inform him of the inability of contacting Starfleet due to subspace interference. He would go on to say that upon analysis of the tapes that attacked the constellation was essentially a robot, designed to destroy planets and then consume the rubble for fuel. The star shot graph placed its point of origin outside the galaxy. However, he stated that the current course would put the planet killer on course to enter the most populated area of this galaxy. Captain Kirk would convince Commodore Decker to head back to the Enterprise with Dr. McCoy. He said the Enterprise would take the Constellation in tow. Captain Kirk, Mr. Scott, and the landing party would stay aboard the Constellation to prepare it for towing. As soon as Dr. McCoy and Commodore Decker got back to the Enterprise, Mr. Spock was calling Red Alert. As they got to the bridge, Mr. Spock was informing Captain Kirk of the situation. Upon analysis, Mr. Spock informed Captain Kirk that it was powered by a total conversion drive and that there was no life signs aboard it. He went on to say that the power generated by the nacelles attracted it and that they could not get close enough to it without being attacked like the constellation was. With the machine closing on the Enterprise and the constellation, Captain Kirk ordered the lowering of the deflectors to beam the landing party back to the Enterprise. That is when the planet killer struck the Enterprise. The blow caused the tractor beam to release the constellation. It would also knock out the transporter. With the transporter communications out, Captain Kirk and the landing party were stranded aboard the constellation. He had Mr. Scott try to utilize the impulse engines for some maneuverability. Mr. Sulu would inform Mr. Spock that the planet killer was veering off and breaking off the attack. Mr. Spock suggested that it must have a radius or limit of pursuit. Mr. Sulu informed Mr. Spock that the planet killer had set course for the next solar system, which was where the Rigel colony was. Mr. Spock would order Mr. Sulu to plot a course back to the constellation. However, Commodore Decker would belay that order and order Mr. Sulu to come about 180 degrees to attack. He would inform Mr. Spock that he was taking command of the Enterprise. Mr. Spock advised against it. He said the result was a wrecked ship and a dead crew. Commodore Decker said that he had made a mistake then. This time he intended to hit it point blank with full phasers. Mr. Spock informed him that its hull was solid neutronium and that one ship could not combat it. Commodore Decker ignored his warnings and took command anyway. He would lead the Enterprise in an attack on the planet killer. In 104 Section B, Paragraph 1A of the regulations prevented Mr. Spock from staying in command. To much to Dr. McCoy's dismay. Without time to examine Commodore Decker's state of mind, Dr. McCoy would be unable to certify Commodore Decker as unfit for command psychologically or physically. Decker would order McCoy off the bridge and order Mr. Sulu to come about the 32 degrees Mark 10 
with deflectors on maximum and main phaser banks at ready. Meanwhile, back on the Constellation, Captain Kirk would have Mr. Scott cross-connect the warp drive control system to the impulse system. The impulse control system would be damaged, damaged beyond repair. However, the warp drive controls were in good condition. Captain Kirk was in auxiliary control working on restoring the viewing screen, ordering Washburn to try to fix the 2G6 circuit. At that time, the Enterprise was attacking the Planet Killer. It would fire at the Enterprise and Mr. Spock would urge Decker to back off. Decker ignored his warnings, saying duly noted. He ordered the firing of the phasers. Mr. Sulu would inform him that they just bounced off. Back on the Constellation, Captain Kirk had restored the viewing screen, and that's when he had seen the Enterprise dangerously close firing on the Planet Killer with no effect. Mr. Scott informed him that the Constellation should have power shortly to move. Back on the Enterprise, Decker would order phases fired again, and again with no effect. The Planet Killer would fire a beam at the Enterprise, knocking out the deflectors and causing damage and casualties, including inner hull rupture. Mr. Spock urged withdrawal and cited that an attempt to continue the attack would be suicide. He then cited that suicidal behavior would be indeed reasons for relieving Commodore Decker of his command. Decker would order the Enterprise to veer off, however, they would be stuck in the tractor beam being drawn into the maw of the planet killer. Mr. Scott would restore the impulse drive on the Constellation and inform the captain that he already had one of the phaser banks fully charged. They were able to fire phasers at the planet killer and as a result, it let the Enterprise go. The bad news was that it started to come for the Constellation, but the Enterprise would do the favor in return and fire on it and it would break off its pursuit of the Constellation, allowing both ships to get away. Mr. Spock would note that the machine had a sphere that would constitute an attack on anything entering the zone, but ignoring it once it's left. The Enterprise had lost her warp drive and deflectors, and the transporter was still under repair. The communications, Lieutenant Palmer would establish ship-to-ship -ship communications with the Constellation, and Captain Kirk would ask why Mr. Spock was not in command. Commodore Decker would inform him of regulations that enabled him to take command. Kirk snapped, saying, you mean you're the lunatic that almost destroyed my ship? He would later order Mr. Spock to relieve Decker of command on his personal authority as captain of the Enterprise. Eventually, Decker would step down. Mr. Spock would have him escorted to sickbay for examination. Mr. Spock would inform Captain Kirk that the Enterprise would take an evasive course back to the Constellation to beam him and the landing party back. It was estimated that the Enterprise only had seven hours of fuel left on impulse. Mr. Scott would inform Captain Kirk that he had restored one-third of the impulse power to the ship and that the shields were up, but they would not last long. On the way to sickbay, Decker would attack his escort and steal the shuttlecraft. He would inform the Enterprise that he was going to try to ram it down the throat of the planet killer. Decker would ignore the pleas from Spock and Captain Kirk and would proceed to go inside the planet killer as the shuttlecraft exploded. However, Mr. Sulu would register a small drop of power and he would detect it with Mr. Spock. Captain Kirk would just devise a plan to do the same thing with the Constellation. Kirk told Spock that Decker had the right idea but not enough power to back it up. The explosion from an impulse engine from a starship would generate 97.835 megatons of force. Captain Kirk had said that the explosion would come from inside rather than try to blast through its hull. With the transporter operational, Kirk would order the landing party back to the Enterprise, with the exception of himself and Mr. Scott. He would then have Scotty rig a button to auxiliary control and would force an overload and explosion of the impulse engines. He gave it a delay of 30 seconds. Upon beaming back to the Enterprise, Mr. Scott would discover a problem with the transporter's main junction circuitry and attempt to fix it. He would get it fixed, but it would be jury-rigged. And after pressing the button that would force an overload explosion aboard the USS Constellation, Kirk ordered to be beamed aboard the Enterprise, but the transporter would malfunction again.
But later, as the USS Constellation exploded inside the planet killer, Captain Kirk would materialize on a transporter pad. The explosion of the Constellation would cause all power levels in the planet killer to drop, in effect, killing it. Mr. Spock would later say he could not help but wonder if there were any more planet killers out there. Captain Kirk would respond by saying, I certainly hope not. I found one quite sufficient.